This algebraic geometry video will be about elimination theory. So in his book on algebraic geometry, Hartshorn rather briefly mentions it as um, theorem 5.7a, and I want to expand on this a bit. Um, incidentally, um, in theorem 5.7, Hartshorn refers to van der Waarden's book on algebra for the work on elimination theory. Unfortunately, you won't find it there anymore because the chapter on elimination theory was eliminated in the second edition of van der Waarden's book. Um, elimination theory has caused a fair amount of controversy. Um, so Andre Vey, in his book, Foundations, um, his famous book, Foundations of Algebraic Geometry, um, had a rather notorious footnote that I can show you here. I think I need to magnify it a bit so you can read it. There we go. So he says, um, the device that follows, which it may be hoped finally eliminates from algebraic geometry the last traces of elimination theory. Okay, so Andre Vey did not like elimination theory. On the other hand, Abhyanka um, wrote a famous poem about elimination theory um, with this line in it saying, eliminate the eliminators of elimination theory, which is, it's compulsory to quote this whenever you discuss elimination theory. So this is a poem titled Polynomials and Power Series, May They Forever Rule the World. Um, anyway, uh, what is this elimination theory that people get so excited about? Um, let me just use the magnification back down. So uh, here's an example. Suppose you've got two polynomials such as x cubed y to the 4 minus 7x squared minus xy to the 8 and 3x squared y to the 5 plus 4y squared plus x to the 4y to the 7. And what we want to do is eliminate y. What I mean by this is to find a single equation in x um, that you get by working out y from this equation and substituting it into that equation in some sense. Well, that, that looks like a rather hairy problem because you have to find y by solving an equation of degree 8 here, which is going to be rather a mess, and substituting that in here is going to be a real nightmare. In fact, you can see roughly what answer you're going to get because this equation has degree 9, and this equation has degree 11, so by Bazou's theorem, there should be 9 times 11, which is 99 points of intersection. So there should be 99 possible values of x you get by eliminating these. So x should satisfy a polynomial of degree 9 by 11. And now what I want to do is to write down this polynomial explicitly. And how on earth do we do that? Um, so um, let's look at a more general problem. Suppose I've got two polynomials, f of x, which is a m x to the m plus a m minus 1 x to the m minus 1 plus a naught, and g of x, which is b n x to the n, all the way down to b0. Um, what is the condition for them to have a common root? So I want to find some um, condition on the coefficients a, i, and b, j, um, which is a necessary and sufficient condition for these to have a common root. Um, well, first of all, there are some slight complications if a, m, or b, n are zero. So let's just assume a, m is not equal to zero and b, n is not equal to zero for the moment. And I'll remove these conditions later. Um, well, the condition for these to have a common root um, can be written as follows. If they have a common root, then f of x times p of x equals g of x times
times q of x, where degree p is less than n and degree q is less than m for some polynomials p and q. And if they have a common root, then you can just put p equals g over x minus alpha and q equals f over x minus alpha, where alpha is the common root. And conversely, if this condition holds, then you can see that they do in fact have a common root. So this is the condition for a common root. You must be able to solve this equation for polynomials P and Q. P and Q must, of course, be non-zero. Well, um, if you expand this out and look at the coefficients of each power of X, you get a whole lot of homogeneous linear equations um, in P and Q, whose coefficients depend on the A's and the B's. Now, the condition for a set of homogeneous linear equations to have a non-trivial solution is that some big determinant vanishes. So we have to write down a determinant that vanishes um, um, if this has a common solution, which basically means writing down the matrix of um, all these equations. And the matrix, um, it's not difficult to work it out, but it just requires a certain amount of bookkeeping. It looks like this. First of all, you write down the coefficients of f, and then you add a certain number of zeros, and then you write down the coefficients of f again, only shifted by one, and then a certain number of zeros. And altogether, we're going to do this n times. So we go all the way down to here, we get 0, 0, and then a naught, naught, sorry, a1 up to a m. And then we do the same thing all over again with the other polynomials. So we've bn going down to b0, and some zeros, 0, bn, b1, b0, 0, then we have a all the way down to here, and then we get zero all the way up to Bn, and B0 there. And we do this with M rows. So this is the, we take its determinant, and set this determinant equal to zero. And this determinant is called the resultant. Um, this word ant at the end of a word uh, means two things. First of all, it means that you're probably referring to some sort of invariant. Um, so the determinant is a, the most the best known example. The other thing it probably means is that the terminology was probably invented by Sylvester, who loved inventing funny names for things. Um, he invented a whole collection of names for similar invariants, um, like cataleptikant, determinant, harmonizant, canonicon, and so on. Most of these have been more or less forgotten. Determinant still lives on, obviously and resultant is common enough for people to remember. People later invented more of them, like Bazutiant and so on. Um, well, there's a slight problem. What do we do about AM and BN being zero? You can see this um, massive resultant also vanishes if both of AM and BN are zero. If one of them is zero and the other... Um, so um, the, the condition that a m is zero can be thought of as saying that the polynomial has a root at infinity. So if we look at a m x to the m plus plus a naught, this normally has m roots if m is non-zero. If m is zero, then it will have less than m roots, so we pretend it's also got a root at infinity. We can make more sense of this if we look at the corresponding homogeneous polynomial a m x to the m y to the naught plus a m minus 1 x to the m minus 1 y and so on plus a naught x to the naught y to the m. And then we can think of 
um, a root as being a point in projective space, which is just our field K together with a point at infinity. So the point at infinity will be point when y is naught, and the other points will be x colon 1. And then you can see that the resultant is 0, is equivalent to the two homogeneous polynomials a m x to the m plus a naught y to the m and b n x to the n plus all the way down to plus b naught y to the y to the n have a common zero in one dimensional projective space which is k union of point at infinity um, so let's see an example of this. Um, first of all, let's just ask, when does the polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c equals naught have a double root? Well, the polynomial f has a double root if f and f prime, its derivative, have a root in common. So we're going to take f to be our polynomial here and g to be f prime, which is equal to 2ax plus b. Now we work out the Sylvester matrix. Well, it has a, b, c at the top of the coefficients of f, and then we put in the coefficients of g, we get 2a, b, 0, 0, 2, A, B. So we just take this determinant. And this determinant is really easy to work out. It's just A times B squared minus 4, A, C. And here we have the usual discriminant. And um, we've also got this possibility A equals 0 because we said that if A is 0, then F and its derivative both have a sort of 0 at infinity. So if A is non-zero, then this has a double root if and only if the discriminant is non-zero, which is the result we all remember from high school algebra. So let's have a look at a slightly more in, uh, complicated example. Suppose f is equal to x cubed plus bx plus c. I'm missing out the term in x squared just to make things easier. And we want to know when does this polynomial have a double root? Well, we look at its derivative which is 3x squared plus b. And then we look at the Sylvester matrix, which looks like this. It goes 1, um, 0, b, c, 0, 0, 1, 0, b, c. So these are the two rows of f. And then we have to put in the coefficients of b three times. So we get 3, naught b naught, three, naught, b, naught, naught, three, naught, b. And we want to know the determinant of this. And it's not terribly difficult to work out because it's got masses of zeros all over the place. So you can quite quickly subtract three times the first row from the third and three times the second row from the fourth and reduce to something that's easy to evaluate. And you find it's um, 4b cubed plus 27c squared. Um, this isn't quite the discriminant of a cubic because the problem with resultants is there's always a sign problem. You never quite know whether it should be plus one times this or minus one times this. And in fact, the discriminant of the cubic is in fact minus this expression. So it should be minus 4b cubed minus 27c squared. Um, but anyway, the vanishing of this expression here is the condition for this polynomial to have a multiple root. Um, so in the next lecture, we will use resultants to show that projective varieties have a property known as being proper, which is a sort of analogue of compactness.